Howdy, howdy, everybody. Mad Rizvi here. Uh, time, time for the show. Let's see, uh, yeah, looks like we got some viewers here. Let's see, Jonathan said he's looking forward to this. Uh, if if you can hear, if my mic is working all right and y'all can hear me, uh, if you just drop in the chat your name and uh, where you're watching from, uh, and I'll, I'll give uh, a minute or two just uh, for people to tune in here. I got my seltzer and coffee to keep me alert, give you my full attention. Talk about uh, in a very important copy idea that I think uh, is is very underrated and not not talked too much, especially in copy courses and a lot of copy books that you might read. And it's something that I, I don't really see expressed in the copy of very uh, junior copywriters or junior salespeople, people who are, are new to selling, even people who are very experienced. I, I see this, uh, because it's, it's, it's a, something that requires a little bit of nuance, um, how to sell without actually sounding salesy, right? It requires a little level of self-awareness and just thinking a little deeper about how people perceive, uh, your, your words and, and what you're trying to convey in your messaging. See uh, Eben here from South Africa. Got uh, Preston from Austin, Texas. Wow, yeah, quite a global crowd tonight. Glad y'all are tuning in. Just a, a fair warning. I won't be doing the, the full two hours that Rich typically likes to do with his, uh, his marathon live stream sessions. I actually have a hard stop at uh, 7.30 Eastern time tonight. Uh, for some of you who might be, who read my emails, uh, you probably know that I am a massive Washington football fan. So the Washington football team has their first preseason game of the season tonight. So I have to be tuning in to that at 7.30. I even told Rich, Rich, I'm not even sure I can do your live stream, bro. I uh, <laughs> I got a game to watch. So uh, luckily, luckily, we'll get a full hour and a half in. So I'll keep it. I'll keep it tight. I'll keep it loaded with great content. Pretty, uh, pretty action and value packed here. I have five specific things I want to share with y'all tonight. And each one of these five lessons is going to make you a better salesperson. It's going to make you a better copywriter. It's going to make you a better content creator and being able to generate sales in a way that doesn't feel salesy. It doesn't feel sleazy. It feels natural. People, uh, will be more attracted to you. They won't feel repelled. They'll uh, feel like you actually understand them or are actually trying to help them instead of just trying to pitch them things that they don't really need and won't benefit from. So uh, <laughs> hail to the Redskins, Lee. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I got Johnny from New Zealand, Lisa from Miami Beach, Russ from uh, Columbia, I uh, got Gab from the Philippines. Awesome. Uh, Brian from Port St. Lucie, Florida. I am hope I'm saying that right. I'm not have an e-com st uh, store since February and still can't get a sale. All right, man. Well, I'll hopefully help you with that today. Um, let's see here. Got Kayvon. What's up, Kayvon from Vancouver? See you all the time, man. Uh, Got David from Austin House, bunch of, bunch of people in Austin, all the internet marketers uh, fleeing New York and fleeing uh, uh, California, heading to Austin and Florida. I, I can't blame them. <laughs> Ondale Beach, Florida from Giancarlo. Uh, and Christopher Vogelman. Hey, Chris, good to see you, man. Uh, all right. As I mentioned, I uh, I don't want to spend too long with the formalities. Let's get, Let's get into this because uh, it's an important lesson, as I was mentioning earlier. It's something that I, I really only see in a handful of experienced copywriters, copywriters who have been around a while and understand kind of the depth of the craft and how to uh, really write with a tone. Okay, I'm going to be using that word a lot uh, throughout this presentation because tone is so important when you're writing and having the right tone uh, is it can make all the difference between sounding really hypey and salesy and aggressive and sa sounding nonchalant and uh, like you're a consultant and you're 
you know, they, people mention this phrase a lot, consultative selling, right? How do you do that in writing? How do you do that in your copy? So it feels like you're, you're genuinely an advisor and it should feel that way. You know, I think a lot of the secrets I'm going to be sharing tonight, I'm sure I'm going to get people who disagree with this in these and, um, and they're in to a large degree, I think they're right. Um, I think some of the tips I'm going to be oops, sharing with you tonight, uh, I'm not going to tell you that these tips are going to mean that uh, you couldn't be generating more sales by breaking the rules I'm about to give you. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people do violate the rules I'm about to give you uh, and, and make more sales because of it. But I also think it's to their detriment. I think if you violate some of the rules I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, uh, you can be attracting the wrong customers. You can be attracting people who uh, are going to cancel and charge back and complain and have high refund rates. And you're going to have people buy your product who aren't going to get the results that they were hoping for. Which, at the end of the day, you know, if you're an ethical marketer and salesperson, that's not the ideal. You know, you, as I was writing about in my email on Wednesday, you know, the ultimate goal for me is to find customers who want to keep buying our products as strategic profits for life. And the only way we can do that is by having copy and campaigns and a sales message that is authentic and it is honest. And in the way Mark Ford describes it is hat. It's, it's honest, uh, authentic, transparent, H-A-T, right? So we want, we want our copy and our sales message to be all three of those things. And if you're overly aggressive with your, your claims, with your hype, your tone, it's not going to be hat. It's not going to feel uh, genuine and you're going to, even if you might get a, uh, more sales in the short term, you know, by making those compromises as a salesperson with your integrity and your claims, uh, I, I assure you that there, there are long term consequences uh, for ignoring some of the advice I'm, I'm going to give everyone watching this call tonight. So without further ado, let's get into my five point checklist for how to sell without being salesy. So. First one I want to share with you tonight is pretty well known, uh, but it's incredibly important and a lot of copywriters get away from it and when they try to be too direct and that is value driven copy, all right, value driven copy. And what I mean by that is when I first started writing copy and I was on uh, working at Stansbury Research uh, on their team, my uh, you know, our copy chief at the time was Mike Palmer, the, the legend who wrote The End of America, one of the highest grossing uh, sales letters of all time and one of the highest grossing uh, copywriters, you know, of all time. Mike Palmer is a legend in the business. He doesn't do a lot of teaching, you know, outside of his own organization. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get to study under him. And one of the things he would always tell our copy team, and I think he picked this up from that's Vanga. I believe, uh, but or my, this might have been an Ogilvyism, but he would always just remind us that the copy should be valuable in and of itself, right? Someone's watching your sales letter, or they're reading a sales letter, uh, then it, then they should have a big takeaway from that. They should have uh, an aha moment. They should learn something new that they didn't know before. That's going to help them overcome their problem, and that doesn't mean you want to be spent belaboring, you know, going, going a deep dive, like a, uh, 400 level college class, you know, this isn't, uh, some type, uh, it's not supposed to be a lecture where it's unengaging, unentertaining. Um, you, you want to make it clear, like what's in it for the person though. And the way that I try to do this, and you can really see it hopefully in every daily email I write to the list. So when I'm writing, to y'all on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And my ultimate goal of that email is to teach something. There should be a takeaway in that. And, you know, I might not have a, a CT at the end all the time, but it would be very easy for me to have a call to action at the end of every single email and actually sell in that email. And I, I learned this approach. Uh, you know, I learned about value driven copy from Mike Palmer, but the way I structure my emails. Uh, to make them entertaining and engaging and informative while also pivoting to have a sale at the end is an approach, you know, I learned from uh, Ben Settle, which he learned from the great Matt Fury. And so the format of those emails is pretty straightforward, which is 
you, you lead with a hook to grab someone's attention, but then you make a, a kind of a promise, which is usually like an open loop where you're saying, you know, in this email, I'm going to show you how to do X, or I'm going to, I'm going to basically fulfill a promise, uh, whether that's, I'm going to help you write faster. I'm going to help make you more persuasive. Um, I'm going to show you how to lose weight. I'm going to tell you why you haven't been able to lose weight in the past, you know, something like that, that is really leading with what, why should they read this email? And then the, ultimately in that top half of the email, uh, it can be even longer than the top half, but what you're doing is you're really, you're teaching the person what they should be doing or what they're doing wrong. Right? So that, that what they're, they should be doing, uh, is often specific, but not super specific. Okay. So for example, my, my what right now could be, if you want to sell without being salesy, write value driven copy, right? So I'm telling you what to do, but I'm not telling you how to do it, right? So you can write a whole email or how you can have a, uh, a video or a blog post or, you know, whatever your medium is that you're, you're grabbing someone's attention and you're, you're kind of, uh, you know, your front end, uh, marketing piece or content piece that's grabbing their attention, trying to get them onto the list, trying to get them warmed up to agitate the problem and show them why they need to solve their problem and why your solution is, uh, you know, the best, most effective way to do that. So you teach them what they should be doing. And then that creates a natural pivot where it's like, well, this is what you should be doing. If you want to learn the best way to do it or the fastest way or the way I do it and the way that I've been able to help people achieve some success, this is, if you want to learn how to do it, then you got to sign up for my program. You have to buy my supplement. Uh, you have to uh, get this course where I'm going to teach you the step-by-step -step process for actually executing the what, right? Uh, so ideally, each piece of content should be talking about, uh, you know, providing value by telling people what to do. And then if they want to know how to do it, or if you... Or you can take it a step further. You can actually teach people how to do it in the content piece. You know, a lot of uh, businesses do this with their SEO, where they have these long, in-depth blog posts that give very specific how-to advice. But then the pivot is that makes total sense and is very effective is, well, if you want our business to do this for you, if you don't want to have to do all that hard work that I just taught you how to do, and you want someone just to take the reins and do it for you, uh, we have a service for that, right? So again, value-driven content uh, is not always just hard teaching, super specific teaching. It's often uh, the infotainment that I try to capture in my emails and you should be trying to do too, whether it's a video sales letter or a webinar or whatever medium you're doing the sale in, there should be value and takeaways from that, teaching people what to do. And then the pivot to how to do it is the, the sale. Right. If you want to know how to do this or if you want us to do this for you, if you want my step by step process or my blueprint or whatnot, this is, I'm going to show you how to do it uh, in, inside the product or I'm going to do it for you with the supplement or uh, buy, when you buy my econ product, you're going it, to, you know, it's going to execute the, <laughs> the how for you. Right. So there's a, a nice segue there. You're leading with value and it doesn't feel salesy because they got something out of it right? They didn't just spend uh, 20, 30 minutes, 40 or an hour and a half watching a, a sales presentation where all they did was be sold, sold, sold. They actually learned something and they got motivated or inspired to take action and, uh, and buy a product. Hey, Charlotte. Yes, this is Matt Rizvi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, let's see here. Chris, buy my stuff now. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's how you, uh, you turn people off and uh, have them running for the exit. Uh, yeah, we educate a bit, bit VO infotainment. Let me, I can show this, right? Yeah, there we go. I, I know how to do this live stream thing. I'm not a complete newbie. All right, let's, let's keep rocking and rolling here while I sip a little from my coffee. Uh, appreciate it. Awesome. Jason, love it when you come on and share. Really appreciate that, Jason. I know I don't, I should come on to these often, more, more often, because I get such a, I, I really love and appreciate all the feedback I get when I, when I do these live streams. I have to uh, admit though, it's, uh, I like to leave it for Rich. Uh, I, uh, 
I, I don't know. It doesn't scare me to uh, to perform or anything like that, or get get up here and give a presentation. I'm quite comfortable speaking uh, from the stage or public speaking. It just uh, my heart always like goes uh, a million miles an hour. End up speaking too fast. Luckily, actually, I'm taking it pretty easy today. It's it's not too bad. So, we'll uh, maybe maybe this will become a more frequent thing. How's the new house? Loving it, man. It's beautiful. Uh, uh, got this nifty setup here in the home office. My my wife actually uses it way more than I do. She does a bunch of webinars for work, and uh, she's usually hogging up this this office, not me. All right. Charlotte says, great, I love your emails. You are an inspiration for writing and quality. Thank you, Charlotte, really, really appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> despite the coffee, I know it's it's a little late for coffee, isn't it, six? Uh, coffee doesn't affect me though, it's weird. I can eat, drink it very late. I'll have an espresso with uh, after you know going to a nice restaurant or something for, for dessert. All right, let's get, let's get back at it though. So that's that was part number one value driven copy. Part number two is really, really important. And I mentioned it earlier, and it's really going to be a, an umbrella, um, for the following, uh, four points, because really everything I share after this next of the five is going to, uh, all the pieces are going to circle back to this one thing. Okay. And this one thing is a neutral tone. So I mentioned tone earlier and how important tone is in the tone of your copy or the tone of, uh, you know, if you're on a sales call, the tone of a webinar like this right now or a live stream, whatnot, the, the, the way you speak and the tone that you have in your writing and your, in your words is really, really important. And communication, you know, it's not just the words that you're saying, it's, it's how you're saying it. It's really subtle turns of phrase and the type of words you, you're using and the type of claims you're making. And everything that I'm going to say after this basically is going to, you'll notice how it circles back to tone and reinforcing a neutral tone. Okay. It's not a tone of someone who's like super excited and I'm jazzed and I'm great. It's great to see you today. And I can't wait for you to try out my product. It's fantastic. Right. That's a little bit hypey. It's a, it's a little too exuberant. You know, you want to keep it baseline, even keeled. Like you're just chilling. You know, you're very relaxed. Uh, you, your day is not going to make and make or break depending on if the person you're speaking with does or does not buy your product, right? So just a, a very neutral tone, uh, not, not too excited, but obviously not depressed. You want to have some energy. You want to be ready to go. You got to be happy to be speaking to the person and people should be uh, you know, feel that in, in copy and in your voice. But again, you don't want to feel like just over the top, too aggressive, too excited, too hypey. All right. And, and again, everything I, I say for the rest of the night is going to come back to this neutral tone and help reinforce that neutral tone. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, David Rio said, I can't get out of my announcer tone, but working on it. I, I know what you mean, man. A lot of uh, it, it takes a while, and it, again, it's a, a nuanced thing to, to kind of find the words, kind of find the phrases. And I'm gonna hopefully help you with that you know, during this uh, this live stream here because I have a bunch of tips that are really gonna make you uh, get out of that announcer tone, like the broadcaster, like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You know, I'm Billy, I'm Billy Mays kind of thing. You know, uh, so <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're, I'm gonna help you with that. Don't worry. And so when it comes to a neutral tone. There's uh, there's a term that, that I like to use, and it's called the skeptical narrator, all right? And that's just the way I, I like to think about myself as I'm writing <laughs> writing my copy, generally sales letters or webinars or uh, video sales letters and stuff like that. I like to think of myself or the, the voice of the person that I'm writing from if I'm ghostwriting. So if I'm writing something in Rich's voice or who, whomever, I, I want to... I want to write from the perspective of a skeptical narrator. So <laughs> what, what do I mean by skeptical narrator? What I mean by that is um, I, as a skeptical narrator, and you see this a lot in, in movies or the, the thing I like to compare it best to is if you're watching a documentary, right? If you're watching a documentary or you're, or you're watching 60, 60 minutes, you know, 
you got Andy Cooper up there and he's telling you the story about something he just discovered. And he's going to, he did the investigation. He went through all the facts and the thing he discovered was just a, a game changer. And like once, once the public gets wind of this, everything's going to change. Right. And you, you trust Andy Cooper. <laughs> I, I'm assuming so, you know, if you're watching 60 minutes or whatever, whomever it is, and you believe them because they were skeptical too, right? They didn't just go into this uh, willing, you know, ready to be sold. They had doubts and they articulate their doubts. And it starts, you know, just very much somewhat on their back foot. Like I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was, I was struggling with this. I tried all these approaches. So for, um, you know, for, for example's sake, let's, uh, and by the way, one of my early mentors, uh, Justin Gershwin, who's one of the greatest backend copies writers I've ever met. And he just, he crushes copy <laughs> and he always would create these epic, epic video sales letters that were high production. You know, we get the film crew out there uh, and he would always have uh, someone who's like the investigator, right? It would be narrated by someone who's like out there doing an investigation. It wasn't the guru themselves. It was usually someone like in the marketing team or someone in our customer service team, or, you know, we would go and get other uh, like outside uh, journalists or, you know, basically people who host shows and things like that. They, we would hire them to be the, the narrator for, for the promo and, you know, would frame it as if, as, as a uh, investigation, right? And Justin would always write these and he would find his inspiration by watching lots of episodes of 60 Minutes. And so if you can write your copy as if it is a documentary, as if, as if it is an expose, right? And that's the tone you want to feel. That's the tone. That's the skeptical narrator tone where someone is explaining to you, hey, there was this, uh, there was this crazy epidemic going on in the United States where uh, people are gaining weight year in, year out. And uh, I, I tried this and I tried that and I tried to lose weight this way and I tried cardio and I tried... Uh, lifting weights, but nothing seemed to work until I discovered this one thing. And I was so skeptical because I, I heard the story from one person who says they lost X number of pounds in 30 days. And then I heard from uh, Joe who told me he put on, you know, 20 pounds of muscle in three months. And then I heard from Mary who told me this and that, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it, you know, but after I finished my investigative investigation, I hadn't, uh, you know, I just, I, I was convinced, right? And so basically as a skeptical narrator, what you're doing is you're telling the story of someone who had doubts, who went to investigate the problem and find the solution, right? And they're narrating what gave them doubts, the same doubts that probably, you know, it, what should the, <laughs> the viewer is experiencing too, right? The viewer is skeptical, right? So you want your narrator to empathize with their doubts and their skepticism and you're addressing them in the copy, right? Like I, I, I was doubtful because it didn't require exercise. I was doubtful because you were allowed to eat carbs and dessert. Like that sounds crazy. Right? It didn't sound crazy to me, but when I did the investigation and I saw, talked to this person and that person, and then I tried it for myself, I, I had to, I became a believer because I couldn't deny the results any longer. Right. So well, what gave them doubts? How what were the facts that led them to overcome their doubts? Right. Kind of talking about the you're telling the story of the skeptical narrator. Right. The, the narrator is telling their own story and they're just narrating their own process of discovery of having this problem or finding a problem, searching for the solution, talking to other experts, talking to people who had the, the problem, to and who are able to overcome it and then revealing the the secret that they found and what what the strategy was or the uh the product or the solution the unique mechanism as we talk about in copy you know what was the thing that led the skeptical narrator to find the ultimate solution and you know how were they able to overcome those doubts and what what convinced them right so you're really just you're telling the story of their own they're they're telling the story of their own discovery and how they went from skeptic to believer right and, and that's kind of the the arc of the skeptical narrator story. In Agora, we would talk about this too. Uh, at a, Agora Financial, they had a term for it. They would call him the reasonable man. I think I think the reasonable man is a little different, though. I think my skeptical narrator approach kind of sums up the 
kind of the arc better of going from doubt to belief. Um, but the reasonable man too is it's important to combine kind of like the skeptical narrator with the reasonable man. They, the, the two voices are in, in harmony to a large degree where, uh, you know, a reasonable person, uh, some, you know, just like the skeptical narrator doesn't sound hypey, right? They're, they're, they're not, they don't have a dog in the fight. And, and that's the way you should sound too. It's like, you're not actually, you don't have an agenda. You're not trying to sell someone anything. You're just, you're coming from the, the perspective of trying to help them. You're trying to help them solve the problem because you were able to solve your problem. And now you just want to share what you discovered, what you learned, and hopefully that they'll be able to take this knowledge and use it too. All right. And whether or not they buy your product at the end of the day, that's secondary, right? Because the ultimate goal should just be helping the person watching this, teaching them something new. And if they, you know, have, if by the end they share the same beliefs as you that, you know, your product or your solution was the great, uh, you know, the best way for, for them to solve their problem too, then absolutely, you know, that's the way to do it. Got a bunch of comments here from uh, everyone rolling through here. Chris and, and Charlotte, really appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. The wild Rizvina's local habitat seeks out a home office. Uh, yes, that's the, very much the, 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 the voice there, right? Uh, Charlotte, you're absolutely right. You know, the hero's journey, right? When you're, when you're talking about that, that story arc of the skeptical narrator, it's very much like the hero's journey. And the, the difference though is like the, the hero, you know, the skeptical narrator isn't, it's kind of like uh, Chris is saying here, the objective reporter, very much so, right? It should feel objective. Like they are, and it should be that way. Like they are just presenting the facts, right? You don't, and this goes into the, the reasonable man voice too, is that you don't want to editorialize. And what I mean by that is I get really annoyed when I'm listening in the morning. My wife and I listen to Up First on NPR. And uh, I, I get really annoyed when the reporters editorialize the facts, right? They inject their opinion. Oh, that sounds awful. You know, stuff like that. You know, that's not a fact. That's not <laughs> reporting. That is injecting your own opinion into things like this is the best thing you're ever going to see. That's reporting or that's uh, that's not reporting. That's being uh, subjective, not objective, right? You want to keep your opinion out of it. And that's how you sound like a reasonable person is that you're not giving them uh, your opinion. You're simply stating the facts. You're telling the stories of other people uh, through, and I'll, I'll get to this also in a, in a second here, because this ties into the third point I wanted to make. But the, the reasonable man, they just state the facts, right? They don't need to be hypey. Um, they don't make absolutes. So avoid that and copy absolutes. Like this is the best thing. This is the only thing. This is the only way you're going to execute you know, this strategy or the, the only way you're going to lose weight is by doing this. Right. Or I, I was uh, editing some copy earlier today and our team got a little to discuss, uh, got into a little discussion about this, uh, a partner of ours sent over some swipe copy and we were editing it and I didn't like one of the claims in, in the copy. I thought it was too aggressive. And the claim was, uh, this is, most likely the best investment you're going to make this year, if not ever, right? Now, the uh, the objection I had to that wasn't that, or this could be the best investment you'll make this year or ever. The, the, the problem I had with it was the word likely, right? It was saying, if you're saying this is this is likely the best investment you're going to make this year, this means <laughs> likely means it's going to be uh, over a 50% chance that this is the best investment you make this year. You know, this is probably or likely that's, that's actually adding a little bit too more, too much certainty onto a claim that I have no idea what my customer, what else they're investing in, in, in their business. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe payroll is, is maybe a little bit more of a, an investment or a better investment that they're going to make this year. I don't know. Uh, but to say likely or probably, you know, that's, and that's injecting, a level of certainty that I was not comfortable with. And I'm totally open to saying this could be the best investment you make this year. And I mean, and one of my uh, copywriters was even asking, you know, well, is, is it okay to say, uh, or this could be, because there was a qualifier at the end too, it was like, this could be the best investment you ma make this year, if not ever, right? He's like, should we even say if not ever, is that okay? And like, absolutely it's okay. Because for the right person who buys this, 
for, uh, I mean, I think it's probably going to be a small percentage of people who buy this, that it becomes their, the best investment they ever made for the business. But is that possible? Do I think the, the person we're promoting, the partner we have puts out great content and legitimately helps hundreds, if not thousands of people grow their business. And of those people could uh, a bunch of them be believe authentically that their investment in his program was the best investment they made in their business. Absolutely. I believe that. And, I, and absolutely it is true. Uh, but I wouldn't say probably, and I wouldn't say likely, you know, I think that's probably a minority of people who buy the product and put it into use are, are going to achieve that, that outcome. So, you know, when we were discussing this with the copy team, it's like likely too strong, probably too strong, but could this be the best investment you make for your business? Sure. Absolutely. You know, I think that's hedged enough and that's, and that's part about being the reasonable person, right? Um, I know likely and probably are not absolutes as we were just dis discussing, but I mean, you still want to be conscious of like, how strong is the claim? How uh, specific is the claim? Am I saying that this is guaranteed this, you know, Chris is saying like, maybe, it, yeah, maybe he's okay. But I think this might be, you know, this might be, this just might be the best investment you make in yourself, right? That's okay. I'm, I'm cool with that. Now people might disagree. They might think that's a load of baloney. I think it's plenty hedged and people like, it's way better than saying, this is going to be the best investment you ever make, right? That, because then people's radar goes up. That's skeptical skepticism. Like you're making a claim that you cannot back up and cannot prove, right? So don't open the door and uh, and make claims unless you ha you've got the facts to back it up. Or if you are making those claims uh, or making claims about what someone else can achieve, they have to be hedged enough where there's plenty of wiggle room. Like for the right, you know, by qualifying it too, like for the right person or for people who are serious and people who take the right action, you know, this this could be, uh, you know, get you X result, right? Let's not belabor that point though. I think y'all will get it. So don't really use absolutes. One In one way, um, one turn of phrase that you'll probably notice in lots of, uh, lots of copy from Stansberry Research and my, uh, my former mentor, Mike Palmer. One sec. There was a line in out of America that I, I'm, I can't remember if Porter wrote it or if Mike wrote it, but it's almost in all of Porter's copy. He always injects it somewhere or, or the copywriter working with him always injects it. And it's a line that reinforces the reasonable man tone and the skeptical narrator tone. And that line is, and I just pulled it from end of America earlier tonight. He says, uh, believe me, I don't make this prediction lightly and I have no interest in trying to scare you. I'm simply following my research to its logical conclusion, right? So that really sums it up. You know, he's, he's not trying, he's not trying to have an agenda. He's not trying to scare you. If, if you're scared by these facts, then that's just the unintended consequence of showing you the facts that he's found, right? It's not about, he's, he's very much like coming to, across as the researcher, as the financial research, the analyst, you know, just looking at the data, looking at history, looking at the facts, and if you look at those facts and you see the chain of events, you know, then the logical conclusion is this is going to happen, right? And it's not because he wants it to happen. He doesn't like hate America or he doesn't uh, want, you know, bad things to happen with the political system or the economic system. But he just can't help the fact that when he looks at the facts <laughs> that, you know, he presents in, in the copy, that that's the conclusion he comes to simply just by looking at all the research he's done, right? So that kind of sums up too, like how you should be presenting your proof and your your beliefs in in sale in a sales message, right? It's just you're just following the facts to their logical conclusion, right? Okay, so that's that's number two, neutral tone. And as I mentioned, the the final three uh, tips for tonight are going. Each one of these things is also going to make you better at having a neutral tone and having a tone that doesn't feel salesy, doesn't feel hypey. And it just feels, as I'll explain in a little bit, matter of fact, nonchalant. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Let's see here. What, what, how's our time? 6.35. We're, we're good. We're looking good. I still got just under, under an hour before kickoff. We're cruising. All right here. Giancarlo, let's see here. 
Uh, Giancarlo, I, I always uh, just see you harassing people in the comments. So that's why I don't answer your questions, my friend. So uh, I'll, that's, that's why I'm, I'm skipping you. Uh, here we go. <laughs> but if we're writing cops, we about absolute vodka. Uh, Troy McDonald, I go for it, Troy. Really appreciate the love, my friend. Uh, John says, change it to could this be the investment? Uh, could this be the best investment you make this year? Yeah, absolutely. That that definitely works. All right. Uh, a view are advocating for movement. Do you still pursue a neutral tone? That's an interesting question, Chris. Uh, you know, I don't really sell movements. And I think um, I think even when it comes to a movement, you have to have a, a neutral tone where it's not. Um, and this this will be I'll actually touch on this in, in point four that I'm going to make uh, when it comes to push marketing, right? Push versus pull, kind of like polarization marketing. And uh, the, absolutely, you can do this and, and keep a neutral tone by stating your beliefs, right? And, and what I say is, um, like, wh this is what I believe is best for me. This is what I believe leads to a good outcome for people. You may not believe those things and you, not, you might not uh, have the same perspective I, I do. But if you, if you are like me and believe the things I believe based on the facts I presented, Again, looking, you know, there's there's plenty of documentaries you can look at that uh, are are campaigning and kind of pushing people to join a movement, right? But even those documentaries, whether it's uh like uh, what's it called? There's a vegan documentary I watched uh, last year, uh, Game Changers. I think that was it, right? It was about this 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 vegan athlete who. You know, and, and the copy is written just like a skeptical narrator too. He's he's neutral. He's like, I looked at, I spoke to all these doctors and these scientists and these other athletes who were going vegan, and I was like, there's no way me going vegan, I'm going to lose all these gains. I'm not going to be as strong. Blah 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 blah. But by the end, you can tell he's an evangelist, right? So there's a there's definitely a difference between like you can still have your own beliefs. You can still. Uh, feel strongly about your beliefs, but there's a difference between like, uh, hyping things up and, uh, let me just, yeah, getting distracted with the chat. So there's definitely a difference between, um, like not having any viewpoints, uh, and you can still have like a, a neutral tone and like, you don't always, uh, you can have an agenda, but it should, it should feel like you got to that agenda, not because you're emotional about it, but because you let the facts drive you to that decision. I hope that makes sense. All right. The line that you said, Boris, his promo sounds like it plays into crit. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, and, and, and trust at the end of the day, you got to you gotta have trust uh, for the long term. <laughs> You know, to keep selling to people over and over and over again and build up that that goodwill with your customer base. And to maintain that trust, right, you have to make uh, very sound conservative claims in your copy uh, that are, that sound reasonable, uh, that, that doesn't feel like you're just trying to push product on people who won't benefit from it, who don't need it, who uh, don't want it, right? <laughs> so at the end of the day, that's just going to, that's just bad business practices and that's going to lead to a lot more problems down the line. All right. Oh, YouTube friends uh, telling me to grow up. Let's uh, put this user in timeout. Oh, I can do some cool things. <laughs> Tells me to grow up and I put him in timeout. The irony. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I can stay where you are for another year or three years. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good way to, you know, that's a way to phrase it. I think again, 
it's a little presumptuous to say like, oh, you can stay where you are for another year or three years or five years. Like you don't want to make assumptions about the, the reader, right? At the end of the day, a neutral tone isn't making claims like, I know what's going to happen to you. I've seen the future. You're going to wallow and you're going to struggle. And without this, you're never going to be able to get over the hump. And it's going to take you twice as long. Like instead, let's get to point three, because this actually answers a lot of uh, people's questions about that. And that is part number three that's going to help you sell without feeling salesy. And that's implied benefits. Okay. I've kind of been alluding to that. Uh, up until this point, <laughs> and Bragg says, did you say Stanford research? I was in the school. No, I said Stansberry research. So Stansberry research is a financial publisher who I used to work for. Chris has got to bounce. See you, Chris. Uh, Heather wants to know, does hyping even for movements, not just affect credibility, also longevity and effective persuasion really like your email rise off. Oh, thank you, Heather. Really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I think even, even if you're passionate about your subject and you're trying to create a movement and you're trying to build a community, you know, you can make strong claims about your own beliefs and your own views and that's fine. But it's when you say that like, this is going to happen to you and, and, and really just making claims about the user, that's when it starts feel, feeling like editorializing, right? Like it, when you say, uh, this, this is going uh, this is going to lead to bad consequences like X, Y, and Z, and you show proof points that have already happened, then it's not like speculative, right? You don't want to speculate on, on the outcome someone's going to achieve by using your product or not using your product. Uh, you don't want to speculate on what the future is going to hold for someone. You really just want to state the facts that you've seen, the results you've been able to achieve, the results your customers have been able to achieve, and the pain that people have been struggling with uh, you know, whether it's you personally or the people, uh, who you've worked with, uh, got a bunch of questions, but let's, let's keep rolling here just on implied benefits. Cause this is really, really important and goes against the grain for a lot of, of copywriters out there that I, I see. So what are implied benefits? So implied benefits, unlike explicit benefits, an implied benefit is uh, showing, don't telling. So you're not going to make an explicit statement saying, if you use my product, you're going to lose 20 pounds in 30 days, right? That's an explicit benefit. You're, you're telling something, someone that what's going to happen to them or not happen to them if they do or do not do X, Y, or Z, right? So that's, a, that's an explicit benefit. Whereas an implied benefit is people making an assumption about what they can achieve by just listening to the stories and the facts that you're presenting to them in, in the copy or in the video sales letter. Excuse me. So the best way to do this, there, there's many ways, but I have three that I want to talk to you about. Uh, so for applied benefits, I really go to the well on these and almost I almost always like never make an explicit absolute claim in my copy saying like, you're, you're going to achieve this if you do this. Instead, I just present people with stories. I present them with case studies and I show them testimonials of other people who have achieved that the results that they want to achieve or overcome the problem that they want to overcome. Right. And, or, or even, um, you kind of flip it on its head and talk about implied pain too. Like, Instead of saying like, you're going to lose a lot of money or uh, you're going to stay fat and healthy for life, you can talk about the stories and case studies and testimonials of people who were struggling uh, because they were doing things the wrong way, right? So just like you can have, so kind of flipping it on its head too, you can have implied benefits and can have implied consequences. And again, the, the way you really do that isn't by just coming out and telling people what's going to happen for them. It, it's back to the skeptical narrator, it's telling a story where the, the best story is often in the voice of the, the guru or the expert or the, the product creator themselves. You know, were they going through the, this problem? Uh, did they also have this problem that, that they now solve for their audience? How, how did that problem manifest in their own lives? Um, so for me, for me, like, uh, when I, when I was doing copy mentoring, uh, one of the things I would teach copywriters was how to write fast. So I had a bunch of steps and a system on 
how to go from slow, struggling copywriter to lightning fast at the keyboard copywriter, right? And I, I did that through implied benefits, okay? And I talked about how personally I was always a slow writer in school and college when I'd be writing an NSA, it was painful. I'd sit at the keyboard and stare at the blank page and I'd struggle to get words onto the screen. And it would take me hours just to get uh, copy or any type of writing done, okay? And I would just eke out words, you know, sentence at a time. And it was very painful for me. And I never thought I, was, I would actually become a fast writer. I had these limiting beliefs. I thought that it was just the way I was, the way my brain worked, that I was too much of a perfectionist and I just couldn't overcome it, right? So me, me telling that story, <laughs> that's just talking about me, right? It's, it's using the word I a lot, which again, uh, a lot of copywriters tell you not to do, which I'm gonna, again, uh, go against the grain here on that one. Uh, but I'm telling a personal story about me, telling, talking about my struggle, and then talking about how I overcame that struggle. And then I discovered some very simple tips that had nothing to do with actually writing fast. I'm actually a very bad typist. Like I fail Mavis Beacon. <laughs> you know, I, I do not use the the home keys and I'm I'm not a very good technical typer, right? So uh, the, the, the skills I learned had nothing to do with typing faster. It, it didn't really change the way, um, like I didn't have to, it didn't really involve just like lots and lots of extra practice. You know, if you just implement these seven things that I was teaching folks, then there are things you can implement right away and get an instant result, right? So I'm, I'm again, implying the benefits because the, uh, I, I, talking about I, right? I'm not saying like, you're gonna get an instant result. I'm saying like, I got an instant result, okay? And then I demonstrate it. So in my ad, when I was selling copy education, I actually took a GoPro camera, set it up on my, uh, on my desk, and then recorded a screen share at the same time. And I, uh, I, I had like a, a Brady Bunch thing on the screen where people could see me typing at the computer and seeing my screen at the same time. And I recorded myself writing an email. So the sales pitch basically was like, hey, I, I, I'm a copywriter. I started off, I was super slow at writing copy, but then I discovered these seven tips. I'm actually gonna demonstrate me using these seven tips in this video and show you how I can write an entire email in less than 15 minutes. And then I hit the record button, I recorded myself doing it, and I, you know, for that, I just sped up the footage, and you could just watch me typing and flesh out an entire email on the screen. So, that was, uh, sorry, I gotta clean up the chat a little bit. So that's that's how I use implied benefits to sell people on the idea of that I could teach them how to achieve the same thing, right? I wasn't explicitly saying that I'm gonna help you double your writing speed by doing these uh, seven things. I was saying like, this is how I doubled my writing speed just by using seven different tips, right? So again, implied benefits versus explicit benefits and really comes down to another tip that just is good writing in general, which is show, don't tell, right? So I wasn't, again, not telling them what they can do or what they can achieve. I was literally showing them and I was going to the point where I was demonstrating myself writing really fast. And like, what is better proof than that? You know, if people can, if they can hear about my struggle and empathize with the, the pain points that I experienced as a writer and then see me overcome it live on camera, then, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate proof point. And, and it doesn't feel salesy at all. It seems it's me just like showing what I did and show, telling the story of overcoming adversity and overcoming a problem. And now I'm gonna help you do the same thing, right? You're, I'm gonna teach you the things that I learned. And hopefully if, you, uh, if you're like me, you're gonna be able to get similar results. Again, just always be keeping that ear open for the way kind of hedging the, the language here. I'm not, you're not gonna get the same results. You could get similar. If you're like me, again, qualifier there. If you're like me, if you follow the steps that I've followed, if you're struggling like I was, uh, you know, if you if you use these seven steps, I bet or I suspect again qualifiers here. These are like my personal beliefs now. I'm not 
I'm not making absolutes. It's certain, it's guaranteed, it's, you know, 100% chance. And I'm like, you know, if you follow the, the things that I did, I suspect or I believe, I strongly believe, you know, that you're going to get results too. It may not be the results that I got, but I, I, you know, I think, and again, more qualifiers here, right? And a, a lot of people tell you not to have that stuff and be super explicit and certain and absolute. But at the end of the day, people listen for those things subconsciously too. And if they hear those absolutes, then you're just opening the, the door to doubt and skepticism. And uh, if you if you don't fulfill, which how can anyone fulfill on absolute claims for every single buyer, uh, then you just lose that trust and, and people won't buy from you. And it does feel salesy and hypey. And because it, you're just you're <laughs> you're setting people up to, to have high expectations that you can't fulfill. Ah, appreciate that. Johnny says, uh, I'd love to know how you think about reviewing copy that isn't selling. I'd love to know how you think about reviewing. I'm not sure what you mean there, Johnny, how I think about reviewing copy that isn't selling. Uh, is there a specific type of copy you're referring to or what do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, Th Thomas wants to know how do you add qualifiers and not sound, not sound like you don't believe in the product or sound insecure. Yeah, that's a that's actually a, a really good question, uh, Thomas. And so it's kind of like the way I'm, I'm describing here, where it's saying, you know, I I believe these things. You know, a lot of people won't believe them. And and I'll uh, this is going to come this coming to the next. Uh, this is actually a perfect segue. So thank you, Thomas, uh, to my my next my final two points. All right, so I'll. I'll open this loop here and I'm going to answer that in a, in a minute, my friend, John. Hey, what's up, John? Appreciate you. Uh, but Thomas has a great question. Yeah. How do you, how do you add those qualifiers, you know, without sounding insecure, without sounding confident? And there's a little difference between, um, sounding insecure and sounding, uh, unconfident and like being, arrogant, right? Like when you say, uh, when you make claims about what can happen for someone else, that's kind of going towards arrogance. Like, I don't, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you can and can't do. I don't know your limitations. That's, 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 uh, that's just a fact, right? Uh, I have absolute confidence that I was able to do this. I have confidence that in the facts that I'm presenting, I have confidence that everything I'm presenting to you today is true. And this has happened for lots of people. And these results have happened for thousands of people. And I, I am confident that many people watching this today will get benefit out of what I'm sharing. Right. So this is this is how I'm doing that. Right. You, you, you can still have qualifiers and you can still hedge your language while sounding very confident. Right. But I can't I can't make an absolute st statement that saying that this is going to help everyone because it's not. And I'm confident that it's not going to help everyone. It is. I'm confident that it's going to help a select number of people who are truly a good fit for what I'm offering, right? And that's kind of the ultimate level of confidence, which is uh, you're not needy, you're not desperate, right? You don't want to sell anything to someone if you don't believe uh, that they're a good fit, right? And not everyone's going to be a good fit, right? So if you if you sound overconfident and arrogant, that almost is a, a, a subconscious signal that you're insecure, that you're so desperate for the sale that you're willing to say, you know, say anything to make this person feel like they're going to achieve the outcome, right? Victoria says, thank you, Matt, for speaking the truth. Appreciate that, Victoria. Um, so that brings us to point number four of how to sell without sounding salesy, and that is push marketing, all right? So this goes by a lot of names. Push marketing is one of them. Uh, ben Settle likes to call it repulsion marketing because he likes to repel people, you know, from uh, who are not his ideal buyers. And this has been a strategy, uh, you know, that's, that's as old as direct response and old as sales. Um, and it's very, very effective and not enough people use it because they don't use it I'm sorry, this is my 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 LASIK eye, which I'm getting surgery on because I got a clogged tear duct. So I'm not crying. I promise. I just this 
it chronically waters and I'm getting that fixed uh, next month. So with repulsion marketing, the ultimate goal is to qualify who this is for and who it's not for. So Thomas says, uh, so it's a bit like negative strip lining. I, I don't know what negative strip lining means, uh, but maybe <laughs> it's, it's possible that it means that. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more and, and you can tell me uh, if, if it is, if we're on the same page here. But push marketing is, is really just qualifying the people on who is right for your offer and who is wrong for. And, and this qualification too goes back to the tone, right? Of being a reasonable person, of being a skeptical narrator. Like, hey, this this probably won't work for everyone, right? If, if, uh, if you're not willing to put in the time, if you're not willing to put in the work, uh, if you're not willing to invest in yourself and your business, you know, or, or like, this isn't a cheap product or this isn't a cheap service. This is a really high quality product. It's, it's a luxury good. It's not for everyone. It's not designed for everyone, right? Not everyone is going to get results when they use this. And th that's the fact. <laughs> like if, if you're not saying that in the copy, uh, you're <laughs> pe people know it, right? So if they already know it, it, it shouldn't be for everyone and it's not for everyone. And people don't want products that are for everyone, right? If, if, someone's buying your product, it's because they think it's going to work for them. And it's because they, they have a problem that they've tried to solve a million different ways and none of it's worked before. Right. And so they, they're coming to you because they think that you have a unique solution that's going to be different than everything else they've tried that supposedly works for everyone, but hasn't worked for them. Right. So if you can be explicit and honest and transparent, you know, and authentic and say, that, hey, this isn't going to work for everyone. There's a lot of people who are going to buy this and they're going to be disappointed because you know what? They probably wanted a, a quick fix. They wanted a silver bullet. They wanted a magic pill. And this is none of those things, right? Uh, this, is, this isn't cheap. Uh, this isn't fast. This isn't easy. <laughs> you know, it's going to take some time to get results. But if you're like Sandy, who, you know, is a stay at home mom and she just spent an hour every morning working on this solution you know, and she was able to get results. Uh, I think you can too, right? Again, those qualifying line, little pieces here. Like if you're willing to do what she does, I think you can too. Again, it's just being reasonable, <laughs> you know? It's not being insecure. It, it's being actually more secure and more confident by pushing people away who you think are gonna be bad customers and bad buyers and have a bad experience with your product. And that is the ultimate security and confidence in your selling. Uh, I hear... Cole Gordon and I know the guys at Sales Mentor talk about this a lot. A lot taking leadership on on a sales call, you know, and that's uh, you know that's not bravado, that's not arrogance. Uh, that, that's really just kind of uh, being firm in there, like who this will help and who this is right for. And if if this is right for you, I'm going to tell you it's right for you. But if it's not, I'm going to tell you it's not right for you either, right? So I'm going to help you make a, a good decision. I'm taking leadership in this conversation here. Uh, but it's because I, I want what's the best for you, what's best for you. And that that doesn't always mean it's it's by buying a product or service. And I'm going to I'm going to let you know that up front because I, I want you to make a good decision. I don't want to bring you into something that you're not ready for or it's not right for you. And again, all this language I'm saying right here, this is push marketing, right? <laughs> so, so like talking about the, the ugly warts of your offer, like, hey, we don't offer guarantees, right? This is, there's a sunk cost in this. Uh, I want people who are serious and committed. I don't want tire kickers. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, it's very expensive to do the event we're hosting. And so like once the tickets are booked, it's non-refundable, right? Uh, and people understand that and they realize that and, and lots of people will buy and that just makes them more qualified customers because of that. And there's going to be lower refunds, less cancellations, less chargebacks, and they're just going to be a, a higher quality qualified buyer, which at the end of the day means maybe slightly more less sales but uh, i guarantee you your ltvs are going to be higher and uh your your stick rates are going to be higher and you're just going to have a lot less problems in your customer service side uh less tickets less overhead to you know handle all, all those inquiries and whatnot so absolutely yeah like you said thomas benzo calls it push marketing i, I know he always refers to it as uh, rep repulsion marketing as well because he likes to be extra repulsive which, which I can dig. 
uh, and just, yeah, I, I do this in my emails a, a lot too. It's like, if you don't like to get offers and, and hear about marketing and hear about, you know, what's going on in my day-to-day -day life too, then uh, there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom, my friends, get <laughs> take, take advantage of it. Um, and again, I think that comes from a place of, of confidence. And when people feel that confidence that you're not needy, you're not desperate, you don't, uh, you're, and you're willing to push people away, that makes you even more desirable. It makes it you even more trustworthy, and it feels a lot less salesy, right? Which is the ultimate goal of this this talk tonight. All right, quick recap. I know we've been going on an hour now. And I have uh, 29 minutes until kickoff. So uh, from the top to sell without feeling salesy. So far, we've discussed value-driven copy and how your 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 copy and your, your content should be telling people what to do and providing value by teaching them what to do. But then if they want to learn how to do it, that's when you it, it makes a natural pivot and segue into your product or service without feeling like you're just pushing something on them because you've actually led with value first, right? The next part is a neutral tone. So you're not sounding hypey, you're not sounding salesy, you're not sounding aggressive. Uh, and that's following the, the skeptical narrator framework that I spoke about earlier, where it sounds like you're, you're uh, hosting a documentary or you're featured on 60 Minutes and you're doing this investigation and you're talking about how you started off with all these doubts and skepticism and overcame that and those doubts that you overcame and how you're able to finally believe that, you know, this solution was the, the holy grail or whatever it was, right? Uh, you know, why, why it's so special. While also following the, the reasonable kind of man voice where you're not using absolutes, uh, you're, you're avoiding hypey, direct, uh, aggressive claims, and you're kind of following that, uh, just like the, the logical chain of events as you present the facts to, to your reader or your listener. And then third, we got implied benefits. So not making explicit statements about what you are, you as the viewer or reader is gonna achieve, uh, but just by telling stories about what's happened in your own life and the lives of the people you've helped and touched and how they were able to overcome their problem. And if you follow what they've done and what you've done, then you suspect that they might be able to achieve similar results, right? And again, avoiding the word you in copy. And again, that goes against the grain to what a lot of copywriters teach. But if you want to, uh, if you want to learn to be really good and have lots of implied benefits, just think about every time you're using the word you and flip it around. Like, how can I replace this with a story or an anecdote or a testimonial of, of someone else doing the claim that I'm trying to prove? and then turn, turn that into an implied benefit instead of an explicit one, all right? And then number four, we just discussed push marketing, really qualifying your audience and letting them know who this is right for, who it's not right for, uh, why they shouldn't wanna buy it and who will not have a good time if they buy the product uh, and, and what, uh, and kind of like the, the warts of the product, you know, and, and why they, they shouldn't wanna be a customer. And often those are the, that just makes you even feel feel even more genuine and real and, and honest. And, and uh, you know, that's really disarming in, in copy because there's so many, you know, charlatans out there and just people willing to say anything to make a buck. And then lastly, my, my point number five tonight on how to sell without being salesy is a matter of fact call to action. All right. And this, uh, again, ties back into just having a a very casual, neutral, nonchalant tone in your in your copy where you can have strong beliefs, uh, but you're not really, at the end of the day, you're, you're not gonna be heartbroken if someone doesn't buy your product, if they don't click the button, if they don't subscribe, if they don't engage, right? If they don't do what you're asking them to do, your world's not gonna end. Your business is gonna be just fine. You're hardly gonna notice whether or not they subscribe or they buy or not like, right? And that's kind of the, the, the feel and the tone that I like to have in my call to, calls to action, right? It, you can still have urgency in there. You can still have scarcity, but you're stating these things as a matter of fact. If, if it's for example, right? And I'll just copy talk a little bit. 
So if this sounds like it's right for you and you're ready to get serious about your business, uh, check out this, this new course we just created. Uh, right, right now we have a special deal since we, we just put it online or it's 50% off, but it goes away at midnight. So if you're interested, click below to get all the details. Your pen pal matters to me, right? So again, it's got urgency, it's got scarcity. There's a call to action, but as a matter of fact, it's like, here's what's going on. Here are the details of it. If you think that sounds interesting for you, I, I don't know. It, I know it's interesting for me and lots of other people who have similar problems, but I don't know if it's interesting for you. I don't know if it's gonna work for you. Uh, I don't know if even you should buy it. So, but if, if after everything you read, you still think it's cool, if you're still uh, want to take the next step, there's a button for you, <laughs> you know? So again, it's this matter of fact tone. And the way I, the analogy I like to think about it is um, with, with a matter of fact tone, it, it's, I, I do the same thing when I invite friends for, for like an event or a date, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of people who are in, uh, I haven't dated in almost a decade, but uh, when, when I used to date uh, before I met my wife uh, or, or when I'm currently like wanting to make plans with friends or something like that, what I don't do is I don't, I don't text my friends and be like, hey, do you want to go to the movies on Friday night? And that's a perfectly fine way to invite friends or whoever to go to the movies on Friday night. But the better way to do that is say, hey, I'm going to the movies on Friday night with so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. um, if you want to come too, we're, we're going at 8 o'clock. Uh, just, just text me the deets or and I'll meet you up later. Right? So let's look at how those are different. <laughs> you know, one is saying, one is like you're depending on the other person. Like you're not going to go to the movies if they don't go to the movies. You know, it's like it, it comes across more needy. Right. And it's a little more desperate. Like it's not like overly desperate. It's not like, hey, can you please go to the movies with me? I really want to go and I won't go unless you come with me. But uh, that's kind of implied sometimes when you just are like, hey, do you do you want to go to the movies with me on Friday night? Whereas the the opposite, you know, the, the, other, the other approach that I just talked about here is. Hey, I'm, I'm going I'm doing this already. Like I'm doing this with or without you. I'm going to have a great time. Honestly. It would be, it'd be cool if you go, but I mean, we're going to have a blast with or without you. And, again, and this, this is not, you're not saying this explicitly, but this is the impl implied message of when you have this frame in, in the call to action, right? So it's like you add qualifiers, like if you're interested, you know, if that sounds cool to you or you want to check this out, I'm doing this anyways. Like lots of people are doing this with me. We're going to have a great time. And if, I don't know if that sounds interesting, if that might interest you, you know, go check it out too, you know? And again, <laughs> when, you, when you frame it like that, and so just always think about it, it's like, it's in, like inviting your friends to go out, like, or inviting, uh, you know, someone you're interested in, out on a date. When you frame it as if something, I'm doing this something else, I'm doing something that's going on, we're gonna have a great time, all these other people are doing it too, we're gonna be great with or without you, then it doesn't feel like a hard push, right? It's not, hey, I need you to click the button right now and I need you to buy this because uh, we're getting started and otherwise you're gonna miss it, right? I, I, It should sound like I don't care if you miss it or not, but I, I have an obligation to let you know, <laughs> you know? It's, uh, it's we're, we're doing this really cool thing. We have this awesome coaching program, but there's only a select number of people that's filling up fast, um, but we're getting started right on Monday. So if, if you want to be part of what we're doing, you need to act quickly because um, I know the I know I've gotten huge results by doing this. I know the people we've worked with so far have gotten incredible results. Um, but again, it's not for everyone. And if you think that can help you, I uh, make sure you sign up by then because again, we're getting started on Monday with or without you kind of thing, right? So that's that's really the way I like to do calls to action, uh, and. and it depends on the medium too. Like if it's an email and you're getting someone to do a click, you can really just have kind of like these one to three line CTAs that are just very short at the end, kind of off the hand, offhand. You know, when we're talking about the structure of an email and you're saying, this is 
what you should be doing, what you should be doing is uh, you should be following the ketogenic diet even when you're making breakfast, lunch, dinner, and even desserts. Oh, and by the way, uh, I do have a, a new cookbook uh, out that's been getting incredible results from people following keto and uh, the meals are delicious. If you want to check it out, there's a link below that we're having a sale on that ends on Sunday. Go check it out, all right? So it's almost like the CTA is an afterthought. It's like, here's all this value. Here's all this education. Here's all these, uh, uh, here's the benefits of using this unique mechanism that I just showed you. But if you want to take it to the next level, if you want to do what we're doing, if you want our help to, to implement this thing, then go check out this link. Go take advantage of this uh, deal we're running right now. And again, it's just not, it's not hype. It's not spending 20 pages talking about must buy now, you know, going, going gone. You know, you're not, uh, you're not the auctioneer, you know, slamming his gavel down going once, going twice. Are you coming or not? You know, uh, it just feels, yeah, relaxed, very calm, casual, off the cuff, matter of fact, CTA. So there you have it, folks. Those are my five ways that I strive to uh, sell without feeling salesy, right? And as, as I mentioned, a lot of these go back in time to tone. A matter of fact, CTA is all about the tone. Push marketing, right? Qualifying people sets the tone of uh, you're very neutral. You're not desperate. You're not needy. Uh, you don't need the sale, right? People can feel that, especially on the phone when you're trying to close on the phone. Uh, again, implied benefits, it, instead of telling people you're going to do this or you're going to do that or you're going to lose all this weight or you're going to make all this money, just talking about what happened for me. And you know what? I can't make these claims about you and your experience, but I can say that uh, this is how I made a million dollars or this is how I lost 30 pounds or this is how I saved my marriage. And you know, if you want to learn what I did, here's here's what you can do next, right? So implied benefits instead of the explicit stuff, and a neutral tone following that skeptical narrator approach, having a reasonable uh, reasonable claims, not making absolutes, hedging your your claims when you are talking about what they can achieve, uh, and just really you know toning that back, and then just leading with value. And anytime you you lead with value and you really teach something. Uh, in an entertaining, engaging, fun, exciting way, then people don't even feel like they're reading copy at all. They don't feel like they're they're watching a sales message. They feel like you're you're just a a trusted friend who they're trying to learn from, and that's that's the ultimate goal, and that's the ultimate way to sell without feeling salesy. So, got about fifteen minutes that I can uh, take questions. If anyone wants to stick around and has got some questions, I can answer the answer before kickoff. So uh, give me, let me sip my seltzer while if anyone's got some stuff for me and I'll, uh, we'll chat. Awesome. David says, glad I've been sticking around these live broadcasts. So much value. Thank you to you and Rich. Appreciate that, David. Uh, Russ says, enjoy your game. My heart stuff is now. Thank you. Appreciate that, man. Uh, people having their heart stops. I understand that. Thanks, Matt. This is very helpful and informative. I appreciate your willingness to tell it like it is and keeping it real. And that you also, Rich, for bringing Matt to us. <laughs> I'll pass along that to Rich. Really appreciate y'all's y'all's comments tonight making me feel loved and appreciated while I sub in for the big man. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the idea of pre-selling upsells, pre-selling the concept, the offer, even the price? Ask Preston Bates. Um, I, need, I need a little more elaboration on that, Preston. What do, what do you mean by pre-selling uh, the concepts, the offer, even even the price. You know, I I think it depends, right? Like sometimes in an email, before people even click on the page to the VSL or the order form or whatnot, I might drive the price. I might say, hey, tickets are this amount, or we just came out with a new book and you can get it for free. Just pay seven ninety five for shipping. It really, you know, on, in terms of like dropping the price before an actual order form. Uh, I think it depends on the price. 
I think the higher the price, the the more the more copy and warm up you need before you finally reveal the price. Uh, you know, like high ticket offers and stuff like that. Or if you're doing enterprise SaaS sales, you know that's something that you really only share the price until you get someone on the phone and you've really built up the value. And you've done a a demo or you've gone through a webinar with them or something like that. Um, so in terms of the concept and the offer, you know, especially on an email list, you should always be selling those things, whether directly or indirectly, like through our daily emails, you know, I'm, I'm constantly talking about different copy ideas and business strategies and, you know, our, our thought processes, processes at strategic profits and, and how we operate our own business. And, um, you know, ultimately that, that does sell people on the concepts that we want to eventually sell them, you know? So, uh, our philosophies of how we run our business and, and the, what we teach the people on our list tie perfectly into the products that we sell because they fulfill and they follow those same principles and ideas and concepts too, right? So if you're educating people through your content and your marketing, um, then that naturally is going to, uh, lead to people already being pre-sold on, you know, the sales you have later down the pike, uh, whether that's, you know, back coaching or, um, you know, high, high, higher ticket done for you services or, you know, if you have an agency or something like that. So absolutely. Uh, you definitely want to pre-sell people, but again, that's like through the education, right? So that's kind of my, my tip number one of uh, value driven copy of teaching them what to do. And it's like, if you want to know how to do it, or if you want some, a done for you solution, and if you want us to do it for you, then, right. Uh, so you kind of, you can kind of break that up too. So, you know, you can have plenty of value only content that's teaching the what, and then, um, you know, maybe in follow-up sequences or follow-up emails or, uh, the webinar webinars later on, that, that's when you reveal the, the how to's. Victoria says, I had achieved that goal. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Johnny says, thanks, Matt. Amazing workshop. Really appreciate y'all. <laughs> uh, David asks, uh, should we include a sales CTA in every email or just provide values fine? Yeah, I think um, this is a philosophical email that uh, or a philosophical question that I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't sell in every email, but I know plenty of people who do sell in every email. And frankly, I think I should sell more in every email, but my, <laughs> the reason I don't sell in every email is just because I don't always have an offer that is congruent with what I'm talking about. So if I had a perfect off, which I think we'll be doing more of, and when I say sell in, in my emails, what I really mean is like at the end, having like a PS and doing it in a very nonchalant way. So it won't actually take away from the value that I'm providing in my emails, but just be uh, an addendum to the emails where it's like, oh, if you want to learn more about this topic, then we have this great Steal Our Winners interview that you can get here. All right. And so that's one way I'm probably going to be doing it in the future. Um, I know a lot of you might be aware that we have been working hard behind the scenes to uh, roll out a, a brand new experience for our flagship product, Steal Our Winners. And ideally, I want to be able to not just sell Steal Our Winners as monthly issues, but um, breaking out every individual interview that we do in Steal Our Winners and having those to be people to be able to buy those as, as one off sales. And um, once, once we have that functionality, that it'll make it so much easier for me to sell in every email because I would have hundreds of different interviews that I could go to and whatever topic that I'm discussing in my daily email, I could easily pivot at the end and just nonchalantly, matter of factly say, Hill, oh, if you want to learn uh, Jordan Menard or Molly Mahoney or Todd Brown or Chris Evans strategy on how to do this, you know, and, and achieve X, Y, Z, then make sure you check out their, their interview here. All right. So uh, I should be doing it more. Uh, I wish I was doing more, but it's more because uh, a I've been uh, not lazy per se, but just been uh, like we haven't had the mechanism to make that super easy, uh, you know, in in daily emails, right? So I would uh, I would encourage you if you can sell daily uh, to do it, but it shouldn't be forced, right? If you have just one offer and you're selling the same thing every single time and you're not able to position how it's new or different. You know, that, that can get kind of stale. Um, 
Ben Settle is able to do this kind of well, and so are we, because like his email players, for example, he's always, uh, when he does sell, he's he, he has, well, quite an array of products now, but he's always teasing the new content that's gonna be in the new issue of, of email players. And we do something similar with, with Steeler Winners. We're always teasing the new issue and uh, the new content in there. And then he also has just a bunch of other products as well as affiliate products, right? So uh, if you're selling daily, just make sure you have a rotation of offers. So that's not, it doesn't feel forced. Like you're always trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And like you want, you're gonna have lots of different people on your list with different needs and different problems. And so the more offers you have that you can rotate through, uh, the more, you know, the more swings at bat you have to find something that really resonates with the, the person you're selling to. And then also you just want to make sure that if you are selling daily, that the topic that you're discussing in the email is actually congruent with the offer that you're selling, right? So it should be a natural segue between this is what you should be doing. And if you want to learn how to do it or uh, how to uh, do it better or faster or have our help doing it, here's an offer that perfectly addresses that, right? So it shouldn't be a complete, uh, it shouldn't be a complete disconnect between the topic you're discussing and, oh, uh, I know I was just talking about cryptocurrency, but if you want to learn a strategy for buying blue chip stocks, make sure you sign up for my financial newsletter, right? That doesn't, that doesn't have a good flow and that feels really forced and salesy and desperate, right? And I've seen this in a lot of other people's uh, content where it's like they, uh, yeah, they just, they feel like they need to sell, sell in every email. And so they'll just stick something in there for the sake of selling, even though it's it doesn't actually flow or connect to what they were discussing in the, in the content. Good question, David. Uh, Preston's got the follow up here. For instance, you expect to see buy one supplement now. Uh, you expect to see buy one supplement now, buy ten, three or 10, but what about meet the guru behind it if you buy more or attend an exclusive event? Uh, I'm still having, maybe I'm just slow tonight. I'm not, I'm not try, uh, quite getting, uh, what you're, what you're asking there, my friend. Apologize for that. Um, I mean, obviously these benefits, uh, you know, if, if you can value stack your upsells and things like that, then, then absolutely, <laughs> you know, you're just making uh, a better, uh, stronger, more attractive, irresistible offer, you know, the more. Uh, if you can be thinking about ways to increase that AOV and get people to buy more supplements or buy in bulk or buy in continuity, and not only do you get those things, but you also get to get these other things, <laughs> right? Then, um, especially like on the event side, for example, like one way you can do that is, um, uh, well, <laughs> sorry, I had a guest just join. I'm like, who the hell is this? Um, one way you can do that, right, is by like having membership benefits. So, uh, like one of the benefits, for example, of being a continuity member of Steeler Winners is that uh, you get the issues for half price, right? If so, if you're if you're signed up for a monthly subscription to Steeler Winners, you get them for fifty bucks uh, an issue. But if you're not a monthly subscriber, then you and you want to buy an issue, yeah, you can buy them off one issue at a time for a hundred bucks, right? So it's like you get this 50% discount for buying, being a, a long-term subscriber. Or I've seen this too, where it's like, oh, if you're a member, then you get at this discount on our events, right? Um, and so absolutely like creating benefits for being a buyer and that gives you benefits uh, like discounts or better offers, you know, uh, to upgrade to other things or take advantages of other offers. and. We're going to have uh, even more benefits, which we'll be unveiling soon for being a member of Steeler Winners. So keep that on your radar, y'all. And if you are a current member, uh, get pretty excited because we have some very cool things to announce. Uh, let's see here. Victoria asks, how can you stay in touch with you, Matt? Uh, Victoria, just uh, make sure you're on our email list. Uh, if you go to strategicprofits.com, you should be able to opt in there. And when you're on our free list, I do send out emails three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from Matt Rizvi. And 
uh, just make sure you're not unsubscribed to our list and uh, you should be getting those. But uh, all right. Chuck wants to know how much of your approach to selling is based on personality, i.e. a uh, is a trust advisor ever adamant where does speaking from conviction come in? Yeah, Chuck, uh, it's definitely, hmm. I think everyone's got a unique personality and you want that to shine in the copy too, uh, just so people feel like you're, they know you as a real person. You know, I, I get this all the time, like people read my emails and they, they tell me that they feel like they know me even though we've never had a conversation before or even, uh, you know, conversed over email or whatnot, because they just, they know my quirks, <laughs> you know, they, they know my, uh, my peculiarities, my beliefs. And, you know, you definitely want that to shine the copy for sure. And you should be adamant, not about necessarily um, adamant that the person you're speaking to should buy, adamant that in your belief in the product, that adamant in the facts that you're presenting to the prospect, adamant in the stories that you're telling and like how life-changing it was for this one person and how it changed your life and and the results you've seen. And like, that's where you should be really adamant, adamant in the facts and the stories and the testimonials and the case studies. At the end of the day, you can't be adamant that this is a good fit for the person you're speaking to. They have to make that decision themselves. And the more you can frame it that way as like, hey, I, I have no dog in this fight. I'm really just the, as you as you say in there, like a trusted advisor is never adamantly going to be pushing you to do something necessarily. You you have to make the right decision for you. You can give your recommendation, right? And I frame this, you know, this way in my emails all the time. Like, if you want to achieve these results, I recommend you do this, right? And I'm not saying go out and do this. You know, I'm like. It's my recommendation. I strongly believe my recommendation uh, based on what I've seen in my experience and the people I've helped and in my in and in my life and the results I've gotten and the people I've worked with, right? I have strong convictions in, in the facts and my own beliefs. But at the end of the day, I can never uh, I can never claim or promise or guarantee that you're gonna achieve that too. Because I, I I don't know if you're gonna put in the work. I don't know uh, if you're gonna follow the steps. I don't know if you have uh, if you can afford it, right? You have to you have to make that decision if you can afford it or not. If this is uh, if this is something that's really important to you, if you're going to take it seriously, if you're going to put in the time to to do the research, or if if you're going to you know if you're going to hire a coach, if you're going to follow direction and uh, you know have that beginner's mindset and, and internalize the feedback that are, that they're giving you, like those are at the end of the day, uh, there's only so much as a salesperson I can control. Uh, I, but I, what I can be adamant about is, is the results that we have gotten, the, the facts that back up the success of our product, uh, the reasons why I, I believe wholeheartedly that this is a great product and that it, it is uh, perfect for the perfect prospect, right? So that's, that's the way I, I approach it. I, you know, I, if you are a trusted advisor, you're not, um, you, you should be just uh, always thinking like, is this really the best fit for the person I'm speaking with? And uh, you can describe to them what makes someone a great fit. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have to decide for themselves if that is them. All right. And that's, and that's how instead of uh, pushing them across the finish line, this is the sale really you're, uh, you're pulling, you know, they're, they're pulling themselves, you know, they're selling themselves at that point. And, you know, you just lay out all the facts and you present your case and you tell them who it's not right for and who it is. And at the end of the day, then then it's time for them to make the decision. And when you're not actively pushing, you know, it, they're more attracted to you. They're, they're, uh, they find you more believable and they're even more excited and more convinced that your solution is the right solution. All right. I got, uh, I know Johnny's asking how I personally develop my copywriting chops at the moment. <laughs> That's a conversation for another night. I can do a whole whole live stream about that one, my friend. So it's game time. <laughs> All right, y'all. So good hanging out with you tonight. Hopefully, uh, y'all got some some good value out of this live stream. 
would, would appreciate just any likes, shares, subscribes, commentary. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Strategic Profits. Uh, share with your friends. Hopefully, uh, y'all got a, a ton of value out of this and you're going to approach sales in a whole new way. Have a good night. Adios, my friends.